Welcome to the lecture entitled Scientific Explanation Unification and Causation as Explanatory Equals. I'm Andrew Chapman. In this lecture, we'll cover seven topics 1. How to investigate the nature of scientific explanation, 2. The unificatory account of scientific explanation, 3. Worries for the unificatory account. 4. Mechanism, causation, and explanation. 5. Examples showing unification and causation are both explanatory. 6. How context determines whether unification or causation is appropriate. And 7. The relation between Kitcher's unificatory account and Salmon's causal account. In investigating the nature of scientific explanation, it's important to notice that most people take science to offer a particular sort of explanation. There's good reason to think that one of the things that separates different explanatory disciplines, that is, disciplines that give explanations from one another, is the sorts of explanations that they give. Thus, the sort of explanation given by an explanatory discipline can serve to demarcate that discipline from other explanatory disciplines. Even further, however, there's good reason to think, and most scientists certainly do think, that the explanations given by science within its particular domain, namely the domain of natural phenomena, are better than competing explanations given by non-scientific disciplines. Thus, science claims a sort of priority over explanations of natural phenomena since science claims its explanations are the best ones available of natural phenomena. An investigation of scientific explanation is an inquiry into the nature or the essence of scientific explanation. In order to search for this nature or essence, we should start by analyzing the notion of scientific explanation. Such an analysis of the notion of scientific explanation will result in an explication of explanation. An explication is a completed analysis of a thing, and an explication makes explicit the nature of that thing by providing the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to count as that thing. Thus, when searching for the nature or essence of scientific explanation, we should attempt an explication of the notion of scientific explanation. This explication will result in the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to count as a scientific explanation. One of the leading contemporary accounts of the notion of scientific explanation is known as the unificatory account of scientific explanation. One of the main defenders of the unificatory account is Philip Kitcher. Kitcher is a professor of philosophy at Columbia. He's generally an empiricist philosopher of science, philosopher of biology, and philosopher of mathematics. And during graduate school at Princeton, Kitcher worked with and was influenced by both Carl Hempel and Thomas Kuhn, two other influential philosophers of science in the history of the philosophy of science. In investigating the nature of scientific explanation, we should recognize, says Kitcher, that explanation is a process and not some abstract thing 
that we are searching for. Explanations are given. They don't exist apart from the process of explaining. The process of successful explanation is the process of showing that some apparently new thing, something that surprised us, isn't new at all. Thus, explanation is the process of unifying phenomena, of taking, for example, two phenomena and showing that they really are just one phenomenon. Specifically, then, the unificatory account of scientific explanation says that the process of scientific explanation is the process of uniting apparently disparate phenomena under the current scientific community's set of scientific beliefs. The ultimate explanatory goal is to reduce the number of brute explanatory elements in the current scientific community's set of scientific beliefs to as close to one brute element as possible, where a brute element is one that can't be reduced any further. The process whereby apparently disparate phenomena can be united is known as explanatory reduction, which is a sort of translation or redescription of the concepts of one phenomenon into the concepts used in the description of another. Wesley Salmon, a philosopher of science and sometimes critic of the unificatory account of explanation, has noted that there are some worries about the unificatory account. Says Salmon, Understanding of the world involves a general world view, a Weltanschauung, to use the German word. To understand the phenomena in the world requires that they be fitted into a general world picture. Although it is often psychologically satisfying to achieve this sort of agreement between particular happenings and the world view, it must be emphasized that psychological satisfaction is not the criterion of success. So one serious worry with the unificatory account is that since unification must occur within the current scientific community's set of scientific beliefs, and that since the goal is to remove surprise on the part of the person who is asking for a scientific explanation, the unificatory account might be an entirely subjectivist account. That is, the standards of what counts as a good explanation depend on the beliefs of communities and the psychological feelings of individuals. But, of course, the point of scientific explanation, at least the traditional view of the point of scientific explanation, is to get us in touch with the objective world, to have us understand the world as it actually is. According to the unificatory account, the process of scientific explanation is the process of uniting apparently disparate phenomena under the current scientific community's set of scientific beliefs. The central reason that unification at least seems to be related to explanation is that unification makes our surprise concerning some phenomenon go away. According to a competing account of scientific explanation known as the causal account, the process of scientific explanation is the process of citing causes for events. The central reason that causation at least seems to be related to explanation is that a causal story is one that tells us what necessitated the event we want explained what necessarily brought it about, what made it happen. 
The goal of scientific explanation seems to be to allow for prediction in a scientific fashion and to facilitate understanding. So what achieves this goal? Is it unification? Is it causation? Is it both? Wesley Salmon, who we've already heard from in this lecture providing some criticism of a unificatory account, was a philosopher of science whose work largely focused on the nature and history of scientific explanation. His arguments for the importance of causation as a component of scientific explanation were instrumental in rebutting empiricist attacks on the use of causation in the process of scientific explanation. Mechanism about the natural world is the name of the thesis that the natural world functions like a giant and complex machine. According to Pierre Laplace himself, a mechanist, we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of the past and the cause of the future. An intellect which at any given moment knew all of the forces that animate nature and the mutual positions of the beings that compose it, if this intellect were vast enough to submit the data to analysis, could condense into a single formula the movement of the greatest bodies of the universe and that of the lightest atom. For such an intellect, nothing could be uncertain and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. By the way, that thought experiment of some grand intellect that could determine everything by knowing the positions of everything and the laws of nature is known as Laplace's demon. So if you ever hear that, this is the passage that that's referring to. If the world functions like a machine, then an understanding of the causal connections between events leaves nothing out of it. It's a complete understanding of those events. So a picture of the universe that a lot of scientists subscribe to, a picture where the universe is just many different, of course differently sized, but all similar in nature, things that all interact like a machine would tell us that if we just understood the causal connections between all of those things, then we would understand all there is to understand. And that's why a picture of explanation as a telling a causal story of what brought events to be might tell us what the nature of explanation actually is. So the natural world is full of events, things that occur, that involve dirt and rocks and trees and air and animals and people and everything else in between that populates the natural world. Sometimes, two separate events are connected with one another via the relation of causation. Causation is a relation that holds between two temporally successive events, events that happen one after the other in time, the former, the cause, and the latter, the effect, where the cause necessitates the effect. The cause brings about the effect with necessity. Causation is not an event itself, and so it can't be empirically detected. It can't be seen or smelled or tasted or heard or touched. The fact that causation can't be empirically detected has led empiricists, such as Kitcher, to be very suspicious of building theories around causation. Rationalists, however, 
usually have no problem with causation and, recognizing its explanatory potential, are often happy to use it in theories of explanation. According to a causal theory of explanation, what explains an event is what necessitated it, what caused it. Even though Salmon has criticisms of the unificatory account, he still recognizes the importance of unification in explanation. According to Salmon, it's clear that unification is often involved in the process of scientific explanation. However, it's also clear that citing causes is often involved in the process of scientific explanation. And it's not as though, as Kitcher claims, causation is only involved as a tool to aid in the process of unification. One thing we could do, once we recognize that unification and causation are both involved in scientific explanation, would be to try to explanatorily reduce one to the other, to show that really it's only unification, or it's only causation, that's doing the real explanatory work here. However, according to Salmon, such an attempted reduction is unnecessary, since we can see directly from examples that both unification and causation can give good, but separate, scientific explanations of natural phenomena. Let's look at three such examples right now. Our first example, the balloon and the airplane. A helium-filled balloon inside an airplane moves towards the front of the plane during takeoff. This is bizarre. Usually, when something is accelerating, objects within that thing will push towards the back of that thing. So why is it that a helium-filled balloon moves in the direction of the front of the airplane? Well, here's a unificatory explanation. Einstein's principle of equivalence says that an acceleration is physically equivalent to a gravitational field. The effect of the acceleration of the airplane is the same as that of a gravitational field, since the helium balloon tends to rise in air in the Earth's gravitational field, it will tend to move forward in the air of the cabin in the presence of the aircraft's acceleration. But we can also give a causal explanation. When the plane accelerates, the rear wall of the cabin exerts a force on the air molecules near the back, which produces a pressure gradient from rear to front. Given that the inertia of the balloon is smaller than that of the air it displaces, the balloon tends to move in the direction of the less dense air. The causal explanation gives the direct cause of what's happening, while the unificatory explanation says, there's nothing new here, this is just in line with something we already know, namely Einstein's principle of equivalence. Second example, the baby in the carriage. A baby carriage containing a fidgety baby more successfully stays in one place if the carriage's brakes are not engaged. That's odd. Usually we think that we put the brakes on on something that might roll away to keep it in place. So why is it that disengaging the brakes keeps the carriage more successfully in one place. Here's a unificatory explanation. The law of conservation of linear momentum says that the system consisting of the baby and the carriage is essentially isolated with respect to horizontal motion when the brake is off, but is linked to the floor, the building, and the earth when the brake is on but we can also give a causal explanation that says, An analysis of all of the forces exerted by the baby on the carriage and the carriage on the baby shows 
how these forces cancel one another out. The causal explanation gives the direct cause of the carriage staying generally in one place. The unificatory explanation says, oh, this isn't some new phenomenon. This is just a manifestation of something that you already know about. And example three, the peppered moth. During the Industrial Revolution, the population of peppered moths in London grew gradually darker in color. That's odd. Why did that happen? A unificatory explanation can be given as follows. During the Industrial Revolution in London, air pollution darkened the color of the tree bark and the dark, melanic form of the peppered moth became prevalent because the darker color then provided better protection from predators. Or, a causal explanation can be given as follows. This is because of features that are biochemical in nature. It's because of the nitty-gritty details of the causal processes and interactions involved in the behavior of DNA and RNA molecules and the synthesis of proteins leading up to the coloration of the moth. But how do we know whether in a particular case to give a unificatory explanation or a causal explanation? Is one sometimes better than the other? Is it just up for grabs? Well, according to Salmon, both unificatory and causal explanations are perfectly legitimate. Neither is intrinsically superior to the other. Pragmatic considerations often determine which of the two types is preferable in any particular situation. Invocation of Einstein's principle of equivalence would be patently inappropriate for the boy with the balloon and for the other adults in that situation because it's far too sophisticated. All of them could, however, understand a clear explanation in terms of forces and pressures. The examples given are meant to show that explanations of the two different types are not antithetical, but rather complementary. So Salmon's account, which is a dual-aspect account, where there are two different, equally good types of explanation, relies nonetheless on some pragmatic features in order to determine which of the two sorts of explanations should be given in a particular context. But that's not because one of them or the other is better in that context. It's just because one of them or the other is more appropriate in that context. And we make decisions like this all the time about the appropriateness of using some words over others or of doing one thing rather than another, not because the thing that we choose to do, the thing that's more appropriate, is intrinsically better, but it will better suit our contextual goals. According to Philip Kitcher, scientific explanation just is the process of unification via explanatory reduction. Since Kitcher thinks that the thing that will best accomplish this unificatory goal is causation, he's happy to bring causation into actual explanations while leaving it out of the theory of explanation. It's not a component of the theory, it's just a tool that allows for explanation. So this is not because causation is required for explanation, says Kitcher, but because causation just so happens to aid in what is actually required for explanation, which is unification. Salmon, as we've just seen, notes that in addition to unificatory accounts of explanation, a causal account of scientific explanation is also possible. 
This causal account maintains that scientific explanation is the process of citing the causes of phenomena. Salmon doesn't claim that either causation or unification produces a better explanation than the other, but that contextual factors determine which sort of explanation is appropriate in specific instances. Now, we might wonder, after looking at Kitcher's account, after looking at Salmon's account, if unification and causation seem to be playing some important role in contemporary scientific explanation, whether it isn't possible to synthesize these two accounts and to produce one causal unificatory account of scientific explanation. This wouldn't be to reduce one of them to the other, to say that one of them is less important than the other, but to say that they are equally important and they're two sides of the same sort of explanation. This isn't something that either Kitcher or Salmon attempts, but we might wonder whether it's possible. In this lecture, we've examined seven topics. 1. How to investigate the nature of scientific explanation. 2. The unificatory account of scientific explanation. 3. Worries for the unificatory account. 4. Mechanism, causation, and explanation. 5. Examples showing unification and causation are both explanatory. 6. How context determines whether unification or causation is appropriate. And 7 the relation between Kitcher's unificatory account and Salmon's causal account. Thank you.